Um, so as Torben said, I, I'm Mark Sugiyama. I'm a senior architect at Erlang Solutions. Um, and the Loom project is a project that is uh, supported by Infoblox. Uh, and as he said, Stu Bailey will be giving the keynote address tomorrow uh, where he'll be talking about SDN and its relationship with Erlang. So first question I want to ask, um, how many of you have heard about OpenFlow? Okay, almost everybody. Oh, that's great. Um, so maybe some of this won't be quite new. Um, so the problem that we're approaching, that we're trying to address, uh, is to create an open flow controller uh, that can manage hundreds of thousands of switches. Uh, it's supposed, the goal is to make it global and distributed. And if we're going to build something at that scale, uh, we want to do, we've chosen to do it in Erlang because it's the right, it's exactly the right solution for that. Um, because it will need to be fault tolerant, it'll need to be scalable, and we also wanted to make it extensible so that third parties can add their own applications on top of the controller to work with the controller. Um, the motivation behind this, uh, which I think Stu will probably talk about in, in more detail uh, tomorrow, so I encourage everybody to go to the, uh, go to the keynote, um, is that networks are getting much larger and much more complex, and more, most information now is starting to move uh, with it is uh, in an Ethernet network as Ethernet packets. Uh, and one of our goals with this project is to not focus, focus exclusively on uh, TCP IP or UDP, but also think about, you know, in other words, not think about just in terms of internet protocols, but other kinds of maybe proprietary uh, protocols that might emerge uh, as, um, as we try to address some of these issues. Um, and in particular, we might want to build dedicated flows between uh, endpoints, and we might want to use specialized protocols. Um, so, I mean, most of you are familiar, it sounds like you're, seems like you're familiar with OpenFlow, but for the few that, that didn't raise their hands, um, the point, um, the, what OpenFlow, OpenFlow is a protocol uh, that sits between a switch controller and the switch um, data plane. And the idea is to separate, so in a traditional, uh, traditional Ethernet switch, all the function in terms of uh, how to make the decision about where to route a packet that enters the switch, which port to send that packet back out on, all that decision making is made in the box. Uh, with OpenFlow, the idea was to separate the, the part of the switch that is matching the packets as they come in uh, against a flow to send it uh, to the outbound ports from the logic that is making decisions about what those flows should be like. So in other words, um, in a traditional switch, you might have a, a, a learning switch, you might have a, you know, the ARP protocol. The idea would be that that ARP protocol would be implemented in the controller. The controller would then just tell the switch, if you get a packet from this MAC address, send it to this, this port. So um, that separation then allows you to make controllers that can control more than one hardware box. Uh, and you can get a global view of the network rather than a view just from within your one, uh, one, one box. Um, this is also uh, interesting because we're, there are also now, um, of course, software switches, which is written entirely in software. And uh, Infoblox has sponsored the development of one of those. It's called Link, uh, L-I-N-C, uh, that's written entirely in Erlang. Uh, and they've been working with a, um, uh, another company, uh, Clouddozer, and they've taken the Link code and it's now running on Zen. Uh, so it's running with Ling right, right in a, a virtual machine. Uh, so the performance of that switch is actually quite good. That software switch is quite good. It starts to approach hardware levels, uh, which opens up a lot of possibilities for uh, having uh, software switches in a large network uh, uh, doing the routing uh, outside of the context of sort of the hardware switches. Okay, so where does Loom fit into this? So Loom is the, um, is, the, is the name of the controller that we're creating. Uh, it's a controller for an Ethernet fabric. And the idea is that, the, uh, that, it, that it'll provide a way of uh, 
coordinating the activity of many thousands of switches. So uh, it's, it has a sort of a layered approach. And then we're also not focusing on traditional IP uh, uh, switching. Um, so we haven't, we haven't implemented a lot of, uh, of the sort of the traditional functions that switch, switches do. Uh, it's all open source, uh, just like the link switch is also all open source. And you can find the open source on GitHub uh, in the flow forwarding um, repositories. So the architecture of the system uh, is, is, uh, is here. The idea is um, that we're, we, we don't want to build a monolithic controller because we would never be able to get a single you know, set of nodes or a single node to really support the scale that, uh, that, we, that we want to address. Um, most of the other vendors uh, that seem to be working in this space are more focused on basically replacing the kind of uh, replacing existing switches with open flow switches, uh, and so the network controllers that they're building uh, tend to tend to focus on maybe only controlling a half dozen switches. Uh, we're we're trying to focus on something a little bit larger, uh, but also again not necessarily focusing on traditional IP technology. Um, so the architecture that that we're considering. Uh, is to create um, applica uh, controllers which are very application specific. So rather than have a monolithic controller that knows how to do everything, you know, the learning protocols, the, um, the um, um, uh, load balancing and so forth, that we would create individual controllers that each know how to do just one thing and that they would be coordinated using uh, by uh, a, a, another layer called the network executive. And then that network executive would be responsible for um, mustering the resources on the switches, assigning them to these separate applications and then coordinating the activity of the applications. Is that clear? Any questions so far? No. Okay. Um, so the source code for all of this is on GitHub, uh, on Flow Forwarding. And so far what we've written are a collection of libraries uh, that, let us, um, that, that let us implement uh, OpenFlow, uh, the OpenFlow protocol, and talk to the switches. Uh, and those libraries go from the bottom up. We have uh, libraries that know how to take uh, Erlang terms and turn them into the, the binary protocols. That's OF message lib. Uh, we have a, um, a network handler called OF driver that provides the connectivity between the switches and the controller. It's the, the, network, the network connection. Uh, OF is handler is a layer above OF driver which um, provides some abstraction uh, and is an area where we're still doing some work. Um, and then th sort of separately from this on a separate track, there's the OpenFlow config protocol, um, which I won't be talking about, but we have three libraries there, uh, enetconf, which is the, the network layer, uh, ofconfig, uh, which is sort of a low level uh, uh, interface to the protocol and OFS config, which is provides uh, a, the connection between OF config and, and enetconf. It makes it a bit easier to use this. Uh, we've also written three um, sample applications. Uh, one called uh, iControl, which is uh, you from the Erlang shell. You can send commands, uh, OpenFlow commands to the switches. Uh, a stats puller, which collects data, uh, uses the OpenFlow. Um, commands that allow you to pull statistics out of the switches and then uh, republishes them as fulsome stats so that they can just be monitored by other utilities. And then a utility called Tapestry, which um, makes a, it's the best way to describe this, it makes a graph, it, 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 it collects data, uh, DNS uh, requests, responses off the network uh, and uh, provides a visualization for uh, how the um, hosts are talking to each other. In other words, the communities of hosts and how tightly connected they are to one another based on their DNS requests. Um, we're currently, uh, we've currently implemented OpenFlow 1.3 and 1.4. Um, so we're, we're fairly up to date with all of the standards. Uh, our um, 
OF config is a little bit behind. Uh, we haven't implemented the latest standards yet, uh, but we're, uh, we're, there is some work going on to, to catch up. Okay, so this is uh, just, just uh, showing what the, the, the library stack looks like. Uh, at the bottom layer, O of protocol does, handles the encoding and decoding of the messages. So it will take the binary messages and turn them into Erlang, uh, Erlang records, and take Erlang records and turn those back into the binary. Uh, o of message lib provides a more version neutral version um, of that same library. Uh, o of protocol was implemented uh, in a way that makes it difficult to do, handle more than one version of O of protocol at a time. Uh, so of message lib provides a layer on top of that that, that solves that problem. Um, uh, of driver is the handles network connection, uh, and uh, of handler uh, provides a ep more abstracted view of the switch. Um, uh, right now, it's a fairly thin layer. Uh, it's going to get thickened up a little bit as we add the ability to uh, capture the configuration of the switches as as they're made, so that we have a the controller will have a separate view of the configuration of the switches uh, that, that will match what the switch is done, which is on the switches. Um, the OFS handler is also is sort of the, is the layer where you would write your uh, custom controllers, uh, and it provides mechanisms for sending commands down and receiving commands, uh, receiving the responses or the async messages and routing them uh, appropriately into your application. Uh, on the on the other side, there's uh, the OF config stack. Um, with uh, OF config is the library that handles the encoding and decoding, uh, and enetconf is the network handler. Uh, OFS config uh, is a simplified API that that mashes the two of those things together uh, and kind of unwraps the XML packaging of, of enetconf around OF config. So it's quite a bit easier to use than uh, any of those, than OF config and enetconf separately. Um, the, I wanted to just talk a little bit about how the libraries interact with uh, OF config. Uh, so I'm just gonna go through a few of the flows um, so in, in, open, in the OpenFlow protocol, the switch is responsible for, con for connecting to the controller. Uh, so in this case, since OF driver is network handler, the switch will connect to OF driver. The two sides exchange hello messages, which set the version of the protocol. Uh, and then uh, OF driver will send a feature request in order to get the data path ID of the switch. The data path ID is the, th um, is the identifier that uniquely identifies a switch. And all of the library functions above that use the data path ID in order to identify which switch you want to talk to. Um, then once the OF driver has completed this login negotiation, it will then uh, call an init callback uh, to the application, well, basically to OFS handler, uh, to let OFS handler know that uh, there is a new switch that's available. And if this negotiation fails, then, then that doesn't happen. Um, one of the challenges uh, with, well, start something, something. So the, uh, on the, on our library side, the messages are all represented as Erlang records, uh, which are constructed using calls into OF message lib. Uh, those are then sent to OF driver, which, which uses OF protocol to turn those into the, the wire protocol, the binary. Um, one of the challenges with the OpenFlow protocol is that uh, it doesn't provide, um, most commands don't provide for positive responses. So if you, send, uh, if you send a request to make some configuration change and it succeeds, you never hear anything. The switch doesn't say anything back. Um, so. Uh, but if there's an error, it'll send you a message back saying that there was an error. Um, so this can make it a little bit difficult to, to decide how to, how to program with that. Um, the, so in this flow, uh, can show that the, you know, maybe we're, we're, we're pushing um, uh, flow modifications. We're telling the switch uh, how it should be routing certain packets. Uh, and the first two succeed. The third one has an error in it. And, you know, 
uh, I'm sorry, we've pushed one, we pushed three of them, but the second one has an error in it, and so it sends an error back. Uh, it, there's a transaction ID, an XID, uh, that you can use to match up the requests and the responses, but there's no guarantee that, the that you'll get an error back before you send the next command. Okay. Yes? Uh, is it possible that we've created the race condition by sending the third message? Um, no, I don't think so. I believe that the switch uh, will process the, I believe the switch is, the spec says that the switch should process the messages in the order in which they've been received. Um, however, it is possible that, uh, it is possible that you can create, um, you can do, depending on the order you choose to do the flows, you can get different results. So they did think about this, thankfully. Um, and so the idea, what, uh, what they have implemented, what the OF protocol provides is something called a barrier request. So when you send a barrier request to the switch, the switch will send, respond with any messages that are pending um, until it gets to the barrier and then send a barrier response. So this, in this way, you can, you can provide some sort of synchronous interface. Um, and in our libraries, uh, we uh, provide a synchronous send where we implicitly add the barrier so that we kind of fix this impedance mismatch and we say, uh, on the switch side, it's always synchronous, but on our library side, we have a now synchronous interface to make it much easier to program uh, because otherwise it's, it's very hard. Uh, the downside, of course, is you probably don't want to do this with every request because that'll be quite a bit slower than trying to send a whole bunch of flows and then sending the one, the one barrier at the end. Um, so in other words, put another way, the barrier provides a way of guaranteeing that you've seen all the previous errors. Separately from that, uh, the switch can also send us asynchronous messages, so messages that are not based on a request. Uh, the most common one is... Uh, um, is a packet in uh, where you've told the switch that for particular kinds of packets or if it, or a table miss in other words it looked at the uh, it received a, the switch received a packet couldn't find what to do with it um, it can send that packet to the controller and then the controller can then make a decision about how it wants to reconfigure the switch to handle packets like this in the future um, so we provide a callback mechanism uh, in the libraries to receive these messages and then route them to whatever module in your uh, application you want uh, to handle them. Um, one of the surprises from the last PlugFest was that uh, switches also send echoes, which are like pings, uh, and the switch expects the controller to respond back with an echo response, otherwise it thinks the controller is dead and it drops the connection. So we had to add some code to handle that. So that the echo requests are handled uh, automatically uh, inside OF driver so that the application programmer doesn't need to worry about them. Um, so this slide, what I'm showing here is the series of callbacks uh, that, we, that we've uh, implemented. Um, the libraries are all designed uh, with callbacks um, uh, and for when messages are received. Uh, so for example, when a, the switch logs in, uh, there's an init callback from, that OF driver does uh, that, calls the, that causes OFS uh, handler to call the init callback in the application. Um, the switch can be configured to connect to the controller more than once. Uh, the first connection is called the main connection. Uh, and any other ones that follow are called the auxiliary connection. And then there's a whole collection of commands that allow you to say, uh, to provide some ability to customize which um, messages should go to the main connection versus the auxiliary connections. Um, this is separate from uh, the switch's ability to connect to multiple controllers. Uh, and there's a series of other commands that allow, this, allow you to say how the switch should treat the different controllers, whether it's a master and a standby or, or they're all equal. Um, so, and there are spe special semantics around uh, the main and the auxiliary connections. Uh, if the main connection uh, goes down for whatever reason, uh, the switch expects the controller to drop all of the auxiliary connections also. 
Um, at the OF driver level, uh, we uh, identify switches by their connection. At the OFS handler layer, we've abstracted it slightly so that it's all handled by the data path ID, which is a little bit easier, particularly if there's multiple connections. Um, we, the library, uh, um, the callbacks don't have that many parameters. Uh, so instead of trying to guess what uh, kinds of information you might want to convey from callback to callback, uh, there's a, a means of creating basically a state variable, sort of like how GenServer would work. Um, so the init function uh, is expected to return a state variable that is then passed into uh, all the other callbacks. Um, and then uh, the, with OF driver, the state variable can be changed. Uh, with OFS handler right now it can't uh, because of, of, a, of a different API issue, uh, but we can certainly figure out how to change that. Um, right, and then for, so the, the flow on the, on your left has the, uh, shows the login uh, and the, how the, how the call, what the names of the callback functions are, uh, what happens when the auxiliary connection closes and what happens when the main connection closes. Uh, the flow on the right is showing a message being received from the switch and being passed uh, uh, through the message, uh, the handle message um, callbacks. Um, when we s to send a message, uh, the easiest thing to do uh, is to use of message lib to uh, create the record that represents the message. Um, this uses. Uh, we'll use a version, specific version of the OF protocol .hrl file um, that has the, all the record definitions in it. Um, and because the uh, record names are common in all of the versions of the .hrl files for the different uh, OF protocol versions, they can't be included at the same time, which is why we have this extra layer uh, to, to provide that. Um, then uh, you would send the request using uh, OF hand, OFS handler uh, sync send, uh, which, will, which looks up the connection based on the data path ID, and then uses OF driver sync send to actually send the, uh, the request to the switch. Uh, sync send will, like I said before, will automatically add a barrier and then wait for the barrier reply before returning. Uh, and uh, that way it, it turns an asynchronous interface into a more synchronous interface. For um, handling asynchronous messages, messages like the packet ends, uh, there's a subscription mechanism in Office Handler uh, where you subscribe to a uh, data path ID and the kind of message that you want to receive, which is the what, uh, and you identify the module that has the callback function. Uh, the what can be either the atom, which is the type of the message, or it can be the atom with a, um, a filter function. And that function will receive the, the message and then is expected to return true or false. And if it returns true, then the message is uh, forwarded, otherwise it's not. Uh, and this uh, provides for a little more control over the kinds of messages that you receive. Um, it's not just a few examples. Uh, to add a flow, uh, you uh, specify, start by specifying the matches. Uh, in this case, uh, the match is any packet coming in on port number one. Um, there are instructions, uh, which is in other words, what to do when we get the packet. Uh, and in this case, we're telling the switch that we want to send the packet out on uh, uh, port two, output two. Uh, and then there are other options. So table ID is which of the flow tables should the flow be put into? Uh, what is the priority of the flow? Uh, um, how long should it stay in the table uh, uh, while, while it's idle? Zero means it should stay in there forever. Uh, then there's a cookie and the cookie mask, which are a way of identifying collections of, of flows in the switch uh, or in the table. And then finally, we use... Um, if, uh, we build the request using OF message lib. Um, there's a function flow add, uh, which creates an add 
a flow mod message with the add function uh, with the version which uh, four, which is uh, 1.3. Unfortunately, there's this sort of number skew uh, in the version numbers. Um, so four is 1.3 and five is 1.4. Uh, and then the matches, the instructions, and the options. Uh, the documentation for, uh, I'll warn you that the documentation for OF message lib is not particularly good, uh, and whenever I need to start doing these, I end up digging through the source code and the spec to try to understand what I need to say. Uh, this is an area we could certainly use a lot of help is in adding to this documentation. Uh, but in general, the, oops, in general, the, um, the names of the atoms correspond to the hash defines in the uh, spec. The spec is all done in C code. Uh, and so in general, the, the things that look like constants uh, are atoms that correspond to the names uh, in the hash defines of the macros. Um, and the Erlang record names more or less match the names of the C structures. Um, so that, that, that helps to figure out what's actually, um, how, how to construct these properly. Um, then we just send the, uh, that request we built to the switch using sync send. And if it's successful, we don't get a reply, right? Because the switch doesn't tell us anything. Uh, or we can back it an error back, uh, in which case it comes back with um, an error that looks something like that. Uh, I think in this case, uh, this would happen. Uh, it's a bad out port, so that probably means that there's no port number two uh, on that switch. Um, the OK in both cases is indicating that it was successfully sent the request. Um, it has, it, so it's basically a network response saying, yeah, we, we, we were able to do the TCP right. Uh, for the packet ends, um, there's a subscribe uh, function. And then that will call this callback handle message uh, with the, uh, the type of the message the XID of the message and the body of the message as a tuple. Uh, and the state variable is the state that was returned, that you returned to, uh, from the OFS handle init function. So that that way you can provide more context. Uh, so for example, maybe you would include the data path ID or the connection or something so that you know which switch that this came from. Uh, so this, so packet ends, you know, this kind of message processing might be helpful for writing a network tap uh, or for writing a learning switch where you want to see the packets come in and then decide what kind of flow you want to push back down to the switch. Uh, because right now all the callbacks are, or most of the callbacks are synchronous. So it's basically, uh, it's doing a call. And uh, this can cause deadlocks if your function tries to call back into the libraries. Uh, so that's something not to do. Uh, you have to be very careful about that. Um, we, it, it, you know, I, as I was doing some debugging uh, on connection cleanup, I discovered that there were also deadlocks there, uh, which I think I've mostly fixed, uh, because of course, as you're trying to unwind things, you're calling the callbacks back out and they were, they were deadlocking at one another. Uh, but uh, there was somebody um, working on a learning switch uh, who had encountered this problem uh, because he wanted to send a message. He, wanted, he received the, the message and then he wanted to immediately send a command. Uh, and of course that didn't, that didn't work very well because the office handler was waiting for the callback to finish. So what is our current status? Uh, we, uh, demonstrated the controller at the at a, uh, Open Flow Plug Fest in, in, in Indianapolis last month, uh, and we tested uh, successfully with the vendor, five different vendors. Uh, so that was that was good. Uh, we did find a few bugs, but nothing uh, nothing that serious. Um, we also did a test with uh, Ixia. They do test network test equipment, uh, and they created a simulated network of 2,000 switches. Uh, and we were able to connect to all of those switches on a little atom box. Um, it had 100, we were using 180 megabytes of memory uh, by the time the 2000 switches connected, which really impressed everybody there because most of the other switches were written in Java, or the controllers were written in Java. Um, 
And we did have to do a little bit of tuning on that box, uh, things like we had to change the yield limits and the maximum number of file descriptors, the sorts of things you'd probably expect to have to do. Um, we also had to turn off SYN cookies because uh, that was preventing the Ixia from connecting. Uh, and the, I think the Linux kernel thought it was being, there was a done out of service attack on it, so it turned on SYN cookies. Um, after we did that, we, uh, each of the simulated switches um, was connected in a giant ring where port one was a switch on the left, port two was a switch on the right, and port three was a simulated host. So using the, the Erlang shell and the interactive controller, iControl, uh, we, I created, um, just used a list comprehension to connect, create flows that connected a thousand of the switches together. Uh, and then two special cases for the, to connect the hosts. And then we were able to get traffic flowing through this large simulated network. Um, the ease at which we could create the flows like that on so many switches really impressed uh, the people from Ixia because it's like no, no other uh, people building controllers have that kind of uh, programming language right, for their uh, control. Um, and it was, it was pretty amazing when we finally saw the traffic flowing back and forth between the two ends, because a thousand hops is, a, is a, not a realistic network, but it was still pretty interesting. Um, the other thing we demonstrated there was the, uh, the stats polar. So we created a large topology. Uh, we've connected together most of the switch vendors uh, into, a, into a, a ring again, uh, and um, got traffic flowing in that ring using some of the test equipment. And then we were able to monitor using the uh, OF protocol um, stats commands. I think we've monitored the uh, pack, no, the port, um, the port uh, packet counts in, in, uh, in input, receive packet counts on all the switches. And then we were able to um, then the stats polar is pushing that out onto Folsom. And then we used Wombat to graph that data. Uh, and everyone was pretty excited when they saw the numbers, you know, the graphs sort of climbing. Uh, and of course, then they said, well, how do we know it's real data? Uh, so they said, well, let's increase the amount of traffic. And so then the slope of the line changed upward, uh, which, um, which pretty much proved that it was working. The one downside was the significant amount of uh, delay. Um, the switches, many of the switches, don't provide instantaneous statistics. So they're, in fact, their internal software is polling the hardware. So there's a few second gap there. Then the iStats, or the stats polar, was polling the OpenFlow stats. And then Wombat was polling the stats controller, the stats polar. Um, so there was maybe a 20, 30 second delay between when something changed on the switch and we can actually see a response. Uh, oh, well then the web UI of course is pulling Wombat, right? So, <laughs> so there, there may be a 30 second delay before we actually saw something happen. But it was still, you know, it worked. And I think it also um, indicates that there might be better approaches to how to push that data out faster. Um, so where are we headed? Um, some of the things that we'd like to work on. Uh, we want to improve our uh, fault tolerance. Right now, there basically isn't any because um, there's no redundancy. There's no built-in uh, support for redundancy for the controller, so we'd like to add, add that. Uh, we want to add uh, something that's been referred to as the switch-level data store. The idea here is to uh, keep have the controller remember how the switches have been configured by the application so that um, when we get to having the network executive, rather than the network executive having to probe down all the way to the hardware or to the switch, what's been configured, it has something a little bit closer that it can ask that is uh, the accurate, supposedly the accurate representation of how things have been configured. Um, we want to add a graph store, uh, which is um, kind of like a beefed up digraph uh, that will provide a way to remember the network topology, remember information about the different parts of the network uh, that would be accessible from the network controller or the network executive and from the different controllers uh, to try to understand how the network has been configured. Uh, we haven't uh, even taken a start yet at the network executive. It's like, what will that look like? How are we going to make it you know, do the coordination of all the different pieces? And sort of the ultimate goal is this idea of a flow compiler which is to say, 
you have some higher level network aware application that says, um, I need to create a network or need to create a flow. I'm going to send a lot of data from this place to this place. Okay, network executive, just make it happen, right? And the idea then is to take that high level description, however it's done, um, of what you want to accomplish in the network and have the network executive turn that into the series of flows that are pushed down to the switches um, to actually make it happen. And of course, it needs to do that by incorporating it into whatever else is already in the network, uh, which is why we have all these other pieces to make that information available to the network executive. Um, if you want to learn more, um, there are the places where there's uh, references to all this. Um, uh, so that our and our and all this code is checked into the GitHub under the flow forwarding uh, repository. Uh, you, there you'll also find the link switch, uh, link X, um, uh, tapestry, and the other examples. They're they're all there. And I'd like to uh, encourage everybody to um, to contribute to to this because we we are at an early stage and any kind of feedback that we can get about the APIs and whatnot, you have this ability to really uh, influence uh, the direction that some of this, the, that a lot of this is going. Uh, and so there are some ideas about things that uh, might be interesting to add. Um, a learning switch, we don't have that yet. Um, although I think, I think there was someone in Japan I was emailing with, whose name I don't remember now, uh, who uh, was starting to work on that. Um, maybe some sort of lightweight topology discovery along the lines of LLDP, um, add more uh, capability to eye control. It's very limited right now. It's not full featured. It does just a few specific things that I needed it to do to do some testing. Uh, maybe add better integration for integration for the stats puller so that it, instead of having to rely on Wombat, maybe it can go, you know, it pushes its stats out somewhere. Um, there's another problem with the stats puller where it doesn't uh, properly identify the, the flows. Um, An open flow, uh, probably familiar that there's no flow ID, right? Flows are identified by the match set. Uh, and so there, we need a way of simulating a flow ID so that we know which flow we're talking about. Uh, so maybe some way of making a string version of the, a canonical string version of the match to, to form the name of the, of the open flow stat, or I'm sorry, of the Folsom stat. Um, we've done very little work so far with open flow config. Um, so we would like to somehow incorporate that, maybe make uh, some examples uh, that, that work better. And there's definitely a need for more documentation, uh, particularly around how to formulate the messages. Uh, this is a constant frustration uh, for me. And that's, that's it. Are there any questions? Have we considered using maps instead of records for the messages? Um, no, not yet. Uh, I just started playing with R17. Uh, most of this, I believe, uh, I believe we've gotten the code to compile with R16, uh, R17, uh, but there I think were some problems with some of the external, uh, the dependent libraries that we're using. Uh, so we don't actually have it running yet with R17, uh, but that's, that's on the list of things to do. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Have we thought about it yet? No. I. I, I can't say that that we have. But yeah, it'd be interesting to explore that to see if it makes anything easier. Yeah. Henry. Uh, why all the calls? Why all the calls? Yes. Calls generating your deadlocks. Why do you make calls? Oh, why did I make them calls? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So. When, when my, my experience at Ribbit was that uh, we didn't use calls everywhere. And in fact, my experience at High Five was that we didn't. And we used a lot of, um, uh, did cast mostly. Uh, the problem then became uh, there was no um, back pressure. So when the system became overloaded, uh, basically we would run out of memory because the, the message queues would get too long. Uh, and so I thought, well, maybe that's 
it, maybe that's early optimization. So instead of worrying about what that might happen, let's just start with something simpler. Just start with using calls. And if it becomes a problem, then we can start tweaking them and turning, appro turning them appropriately into casts. Uh, I hadn't considered at the time uh, when I made that decision that this might cause uh, deadlocks uh, in usage, in using the, the, the library. So that might be a different reason to consider doing it in a different way. Maybe more an open flow question, but it feels like if you sort of change your network topology um, at runtime and if you get it sort of applied inconsistently, you can end up with some, the network not routing at all how it's supposed to. Is that something OpenFlow solves, or is that something you have to solve in your application? I, yeah, I believe that that would be something you'd need to solve in your application, because the switches themselves, the OpenFlow switches are, are dumb, right? All you do is you say, well, if a packet matches this pattern, do these actions with it, right? They don't have the ability to make any decisions on their own, so that's really up to the controller. So if the controller makes a big mess out of the routes, then you just have a big mess. Yeah. All right. Like any other software. Other <laughs> questions? <coughs> other questions? Okay. Then uh, going once, twice, third, sold. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for oh, sharing. Thank you. And remember to vote on the way out.